Thank you for coming tonight. I'm Michael Dedora, the Executive Director at the Center for Inquiry in New York City. I have the profound pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker, Michael Shermer. Michael Shermer is the founding publisher of Skeptic Magazine, Executive Director of the Skeptic Society, and a monthly columnist for Scientific American. He's authored more than a dozen books, including Why People Believe in Weird Things, The Science of Good and Evil, Why Darwin Matters, and The Mind of the Market. Tonight he will discuss his latest work, The Believing Brain, From Ghosts and Gods to Politics and Conspiracies, How We Construct Beliefs and Reinforce Them as Truths. Michael Shermer received his bachelor's degree in psychology from Pepperdine University, his master's in experimental psychology from California State University Fullerton, and did his doctorate work in the history of science at Claremont Graduate University. Without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I give you Michael Shermer. Thank you, Michael. Hi, hey, everybody. How are we doing? It's raining outside. Gosh. So I was a few minutes late. A couple hours ago, I, I, I had to walk from the NBC studios back to my hotel, and it was like 100 or 99 or whatever, and it's humid. I'm from Southern California. I'm not used to this kind of heat. I mean, I was sweating like Anthony Weiner in a press conference. I mean, it was really <laughs> bad. OK, sorry. <laughs> so uh, anyway, thank you, Paige. Thank you, Michael. Uh, thank the uh, New York Skeptics and the Center for Inquiry. You should join them right after you subscribe to Skeptic Magazine. Uh, seriously, these are all membership-supported organizations. There's no big top-down huge grant givers and sugar daddies and things like that. We really are a bottom-up, self-organized, emergent movement, sort of like the Tea Partiers, except <coughs> we're right. Anyway, so. Uh, <laughs> And, uh, but that's how it happens, you know, it's just, people just make it happen. It's, it's up to all of you, there's no, there's no magic to it. Pretty much every city I go to, there's, um, you know, there's a skeptics in the pub and a atheist drinking club and a meetup group of, of humanists and so forth. That's, that's just, no one designed that or organized it, it just happened, spontaneous order. So, uh, but um, anyway, so my first book was um, Why People Believe Weird Things, and so this book, is really about why people believe things, full stop, uh, period. I was just gonna call it that, in fact. Why people believe things, full stop, but the publisher didn't think that was such a clever title. So, the believing brain is what we ended up with, and, uh, but I am I'm interested in the, the sort of the whole big picture, starting with the weird stuff, which I now claim is a subset of things. Weird things are just a subset of things. So, since this is a reading, I have to, I'm ob obliged to read at least two paragraphs at the beginning and two at the end. Not really, but so <clears throat> I'll just give you a sample for what the, what the reading is like and just introduce the subject this way from the prologue, which is called I Want to Believe, which is, which, which is appropriate because on uh, this afternoon when I was channel surfing back at the hotel, the, the X-Files was on. I thought, oh, perfect. <laughs> the 1990s uber conspiracy theory television series The X-Files was a decade-defining and culture-reflecting mosh pit of UFOs, extraterrestrial psychics, demons, monsters, mutants, shapeshifters, serial killers, paranormal phenomena, urban legends turned real, corporate cabals and government cover-ups, and leakages that included a deep throat-like cigarette-smoking man, character played ir uh, ironically by the real-life skeptic William B. Davis. Gillian Anderson, skeptical FBI agent Dana Scully played off David Duchovny's believing character Fox Mulder, whose slogans became posterized pop culture catchphrases, I want to believe, and the truth is out there. As the show's narrative, <coughs> I'm sorry, as the show's creator producer, Chris Carter, developed the series narrative arc, Scully and Mulder came to symbolize skeptics and believers in a psychological tug of war between reality and fantasy, fact and fiction, story and legend. So popular was The X Files that it was parodied in a 1997 episode of The Simpsons entitled The Springfield Files in which Homer has an alien encounter in the woods after imbibing 10 bottles of red tick beer. Alien abductions often involve adult beverages for some strange reason. <laughs> the producers ingeniously employed Leonard Nimoy to voice the intro as he once did for his post-Spock run on the television mystery series In Search Of, a 1970s nonfiction version of The X-Files. Nimoy, the following tale of alien encounters is true. And by true, I mean false. <laughs> it's all lies. But they're entertaining lies, and in the end, isn't that the real truth? 
The answer is no. <laughs> well, no squared, the postmodernist belief in the relativism of truth coupled with the clicker culture of mass media in which attention spans are measured in New York minutes leaves us with a bewildering array of truth claims packaged in infotainment units. It must be true. I, I saw it on television, the movies, the internet, the twilight zone, the outer limits. That's incredible. The sixth sense, poltergeist, loose change, zeitgeist, the movie. Mysteries, magic, myths, and monsters, the occult and the supernatural, conspiracies and cabals, the face on Mars and aliens on Earth, Bigfoot and Loch Ness, ESP and PSI, UFOs and ETIs, OBEs and NDEs, JFK, RFK and MLK, altered states and hypnotic regression, remote viewing and astral projection, Ouija boards and tarot cards, astrology and palm reading, acupuncture and chiropractic, repressed memories and false memories, talking to the dead and listening to your inner child. It's all an obfuscating amalgam of theory and conjecture, reality and fantasy, nonfiction and science fiction. Cue the dramatic music, darken the backdrop. Cast a shaft of light across the host's face. Trust no one. The truth is out there. I want to believe. Well, I believe the truth is out there, uh, but that it is uh, rarely obvious and almost never foolproof. What I want to believe based on emotions and what I should believe based on evidence do not always coincide. I'm a skeptic not because I do not want to believe, but because I want to know. How can we tell the difference between what we would like to be true and what is actually true? The answer is science. So this is a science book, and I begin uh, the first chapter, well, the third chapter, actually. There's a, several narrative stories about different belief journeys, uh, including my own. And then I begin with a thought experiment. Imagine you're a hominid on the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago. Your name is Lucy. Thank you for getting that. <laughs> there are some audiences in America that don't get the reference. Uh, you know, the little hominid uh, australopithecine. Yeah, okay. Like in the Gary Larson cartoon with the two australopithecines in the cave, at the cave party, and, he, and the guy's going, not the Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> Which I always liked. So you're humming in the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago, and you hear a rustle in the grass. Is it a dangerous predator, or is it just the wind? Well, if you think it's a dangerous predator, and it turns out it's just the wind, you've made a cognitive error. You've made a type one error, a false positive. You thought the pattern A is connected to B is true, when in fact it's not. But that's a low cost error to make relative to the other kind of error. You hear a rustle in the grass, and you assume that it's just the wind, and it turns out it's a dangerous predator, Congratulations, your lunch. You've just won a Darwin Award for taking yourself out of the gene pool early before reproducing. <laughs> Therefore, I argue there was a natural selection for us to make more type one false positive uh, errors than type two false negative errors. That is, we tend to believe things are true that we hear and see. That is, we err on the side of assuming the patterns we find are real and that there's a probably a good natural selection argument for this. Anyway, then I have a long section showing the mathematics of this. I employ um, Hamilton's rule. Hamilton's rule, William Hamilton worked out, along with Robert Trivers and a few others, why we would be nice to other people. Uh, that is altruism, the problem of, uh, of cooperation in uh, evolution. Why would we do this? Uh, I mean, wouldn't it be better if we were just nasty, selfish, hoarding monsters and just took care of ourselves and nobody else? No, actually, if you're a social species, it's, it, it, it helps to, it's good to help your, your kin and kind because they are your genetic relations, and therefore the cost you put out is paid off by the benefit of helping others. And then you can expand that re with reciprocal altruism and a few other social evolution tools that shows why we would be nice to either, even those who are not our immediate kin and kind. Anyway, long story short, it's a cost-benefit ratio formula that's been worked out mathematically and that I apply to why we would make more of one kind of error than the other kind of error. The kind of error that's low cost. It doesn't take much, it doesn't cost you much to just assume everything is real. Usually those things don't take you out of the gene pool. Just picture people reading their astrology column or something like that. Most of the time it's, you know, it doesn't get you killed. Uh, but it's, it is certainly a superstition or a form of magical thinking. And therefore, I claim we evolved this propensity to believe weird things because we have to believe all sorts of things that turn out to be true, and we don't have a good baloney detection module in our brain to help us 
always tell the difference between the true patterns and the false patterns. We have to remember science is relatively new, uh, only a few centuries old. That's what it's designed to do, to tell the difference between true and false patterns. Our brains are not really well designed at that. So, I call this patternicity, the tendency to find meaningful patterns in both meaningful and meaningless noise. But not just the face of Jesus in her tortilla or the Virgin Mary on a grilled cheese sandwich and those sorts of things that are rather amusing. What I'm interested in is why would the brain see those sorts of things in the first place? And the answer is because we have to find meaningful patterns. And so those are just a subset of the important patterns. So if you think about science as a pattern detection device, finding new patterns is good. That's how you win Nobel Prizes. That's how musicians design new musical styles. That's how artists design new artistic styles. They find new patterns that no one else has seen. So I also have a long discussion about creativity and madness and patternicity. So we tend, us skeptics tend to make fun of people who see these weird things and, and, and why do they don't see the world clearly like us scientists do? Well, um, in fact, it's good to have an open mind and see new patterns. The rub is finding the balance between being so open-minded, being open-minded enough that you can see the new patterns, but not so open-minded that your brains fall out and you think every pattern is real. So in the book, I make a nice contrast between uh, Richard Feynman and John Nash. Richard Feynman wins the Nobel Prize in physics for his work in quantum electrodynamics. He describes both mathematically and visually the interaction of subatomic particles as they sort of come in and they collide and interact and then they go back out again. And these various visual di diagrams are called Feynman diagrams. They're so effective that they're still used today decades after, half a century after he first designed these as, as visual patterns describing these mathematical relationships. And so popular were Feynman diagrams that uh, he even painted them on the side of his 1976 Dodge cargo van, which still exists. We, we have, uh, we're in the process of restoring it. I, I've got it uh, at a friend's house in, in South Pasadena in a parking garage so that it doesn't get even more faded than it already is. So if, it, if you, ever you come to LA and you wanna see Feynman's van, it's the coolest thing. And, and as the story goes, Feynman himself was driving up Lake Avenue from Colorado, you know, where the Rose Parade is there in Pasadena. And at a red light, somebody stops him and says, why do you have Feynman diagrams on your van? And he said, because I'm Feynman. <laughs> Which I thought, that would be a cool thing. By contrast, John Nash won the Nobel Prize in mathematics for his description of game theory. That is how players interact in a game. It could be a prisoner's dilemma game, any kind of exchange competitive game that is so important it has implications for foreign policy, for Cold War strategy, for sports, for gambling, for any kind of game or contest. Um, we, you're probably familiar with Nash Equilibrium in which uh, players in a game reach some kind of equilibrium strategy. These could be corporations competing in an industry or nations competing with nuclear weapons or it could be uh, athletes competing for the best doping products as I wrote an article in Scientific American about why athletes dope and because they basically reached a Nash equilibrium in which so many of them were doping. It wasn't enough to dope to just to try to win. It was, you had to dope just to even compete. Uh, and so you get this cascading collapse of the whole uh, system of rules and everybody has to do it or else they can't even compete. That's a Nash equilibrium in the wrong direction. Uh, any case, uh, but you, you may recall from the film A Beautiful Mind that John Nash also saw patterns that were not real, people that didn't exist, corporate cabals, government cover-ups, and aliens, and, and, sorts, and all sorts of things like that. And if you see enough patterns like that, you're actually given a label. It's called paranoid schizophrenia. And, uh, and that's, so that's seen too many patterns. There's, there has to be a balance there. Uh, in the film, by the way, the, his, his hallucinations are mostly visual, but in, in reality, they were mostly auditory. But to make a movie, you have to make them visual. Anyway, so. Um, and then I discuss uh, why that would be. Where, do this, where does this happen in the brain? Well, we have a lot of, quite a bit of interesting research on this from neuroscience. It appears to happen more in the right hemisphere than in the left hemisphere. If you give split brain patients, set them before a screen and you design the experiment such that one image appears you know, on the left eye, gets translated to the right hemisphere and vice versa, and you, and you show them scrambled letters or scrambled faces or just random dot patterns. First of all, the human brain is really bad at looking at random dot patterns and seeing randomness. Almost everybody, most of the time, sees patterns. We're just not good at chaos and randomness. We just don't get it. Uh, and, and for good reasons. Uh, there's nothing 
adaptive about finding randomness. It's adapted to find patterns. Anyway, so this appears to happen more in the right hemisphere than the left hemisphere. It appears to be related to uh, dopamine. There's a series of interesting experiments by Peter Breuger and Christine Moore where you give subjects L-DOPA. L-DOPA increases the amount of dopamine in your brain. It's used for Parkinson's patients. But they uh, get permission to give this to subjects, and, uh, and then they show them those random dot patterns and scrambled faces and words and so on. And those that get the dopamine see more patterns as real than those that don't get the dopamine. Interestingly, uh, skeptics seem to be more affected by the dopamine than believers. When I say skeptics and believers, I mean you first give them a paper pencil test about what they believe in. The, the whole litany of stuff I read from my prologue, ESP and PSI and UFOs and aliens and ghosts and Bigfoot, you name it, there are some people that believe everything <laughs> they've ever heard. <clears throat> Jesse Ventura. <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> Jesse Ventura has never met a conspiracy he didn't believe. <laughs> That is having your pattern filter wide open, right? Not, that's not good. Anyway, so, uh, and then there are people that are super skeptical, you know, hyper skeptics, and, uh, and they, they, they don't believe anything. So, so here's my explanation for why the dopamine would I increase uh, the, the patternicity process. So if you're already way up here, you believe practically everything anyway, you don't have far to go, <laughs> that's right? But if you're a skeptic, you're way down here, you, you, can, you can see some room for, for growth of patternicity, right? Um, so those are the kinds of different factors. People that score high in internal locus of control versus external locus of control tend to see more patterns, that, that, tend to see fewer random patterns as meaningful. That is, if, if you believe that you are more in control of your environment, you're less likely to see random patterns as meaningful. If you tend to, be, tend to believe that the world sort of controls your life and that's called external locus of control, you're more likely to see random patterns as real. We know if you put subjects in um, environments in which they feel unstable or uncertain or anxious, um, people that are about to jump out of a plane with a parachute, perfect sample <laughs> for this, and they've done this experiment. So people that are just about to jump out of a plane, they show them these random patterns, they're much more likely to see meaningful patterns in the dots than those who are just sitting on the ground. It, there's a whole series of these sorts of things. We know this from... Um, the study of the Trobrian Islanders uh, by the anthropologist Malinowski in his famous book, Science and Magic, in the 1930s, that the, the, whenever they went fishing, that the further out to sea they went and the more precarious and uncertain the catch was and the whole process of fishing that was dangerous, at deep sea fishing, the more superstitious, magical talismans and, and behaviors they had, the closer to the shore, the safer it was, the fewer superstitions they had. You have to look no further than Yankee Stadium to see this at work and baseball players who are very superstitious. When they're batting, the same people are not very superstitious when they're fielding. Fielders tend to be very successful. 90, 95% is pretty typical. Batters fail seven out of 10 times. If you fail seven out of 10 times, you can still make the Hall of Fame. That's how hard it is to hit a baseball. So they are loaded with all kinds of superstitious uh, a behavior. So we know it's related to control, anxiety, dopamine, right brain, so on. So this, this whole process of patternicity is built into our brains. Now let's return to our thought experiment. You're a hominid in the plains of Africa three and a half million years ago. You hear a rustle in the grass. What's the difference between just the wind and a dangerous predator? Well, the wind is an inanimate force. A dangerous predator is an intentional agent. So I call this agenticity, the tendency to infuse patterns with, with intentional agents. It's not just the wind. It's, it's a thing, a being that intends, an agent that intends something, intends to eat me, and that's probably not good. So it's probably good to assume not only that the pattern is real, but it, it, it actually intends action that could influence me, right? So I call that agenticity. And, um, and this is, I think, is the basis for uh, uh, animism, the animistic belief that everything is alive, the trees, the rocks, the clouds, and so forth. Polytheism, monotheism, ghosts, gods, demons, angels, aliens, even, right, extraterrestrials. They're always portrayed as like this, you know, super force coming down to rescue us from nuclear war, global warming, pick your pick. Your pick. Uh, these are all forms of, you know, agents that we infuse into uh, the patterns we think we see. Now, 
And we do even more than that. I think animals actually do this. They don't have theory of mind like we have theory of mind, but they do make an assumption like that, at least something like that, that it's not just an inanimate force, it's something that intends me harm. They don't have language, they can't call it something, their cortex is too small to think about it, but they still act in response to it, and I think that's the basis of these beliefs that we hold. And then we do even more than that. We do mind read, we do project, I don't mean ESP, right? Uh, like we know is not true, but, but that actually we project ourselves into somebody else's head and imagine what they're thinking. And, and then we do more than that. We're self-aware, we're aware that other people are self-aware, and I know that you know that I'm self-aware, and I know that you know that I know that you are self you know, and this sort of meta thing. So we do all this complex stuff. We're able to project ourselves out there. We also have a body schema in our, in our mind. Oh, by the way, I should, when I use the word mind, I'm using it metaphorically. There is no mind. There's just brain. And the mind is just a word to describe what the brain does. That's it. It's just one of these fuzzy words that people like Deepak love to use uh, in describing that this is out there somewhere. It isn't. And as I told Deepak, you know I'm right. <laughs> Which, of course, he doesn't believe. Uh, because uh, when your uh, brain gets damaged, stroke, injury, uh, dementia, a senility and especially uh, Alzheimer's, as the brain dies, the person disappears. The memories are, are, are going, the, the personality, who they were, is gone. And you can see it fade very slowly. My uh, stepmom had this for you know, about three or four years. I could just watch her week by week and month by month just disappear. So as I asked Deepak a couple of months ago when we de debated at Chapman University, you can watch this online, uh, I, I asked him, where is Aunt Millie's mind when her brain dies from Alzheimer's, say. Where's Aunt Millie's mind? And by God, he had an answer. <laughs> you want to know what it is? The Matrix. I said, wow, okay, where do I get that besides, you know, Netflix? I mean, is there like, a, yes. So anyway, this is a whole nother story that I, I do discuss in The Believing Brain. That is, um, there's no such thing as the paranormal or the supernatural either. These are also just fuzzy words we use to describe something we don't understand. And eventually we'll either understand it, it just becomes part of the natural world, or it just disappears because it doesn't really exist and we quit thinking about it or quit experimenting with it because nobody could find any evidence for it. So, for example, even if Deepak is right on, he has this theory about quantum consciousness, he and, um, Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose, they, they really glom on to Roger Penrose because he's a world-class Oxford physicist. He's the guy that co-authored with Stephen Hawking the whole theory about black holes and the entire universe is a black hole. Anyway, so he's a big name. And they have this idea that inside your neurons in your brain are these little microtubules. It's like, they're like scaffolding that holds your cells together. Actually, all cells have them, but, but neurons also have them. And they claim that inside these these microtubules, you can get a collapse of the wave function. Okay, this is a quantum physics concept that has something to do with entanglement and spooky action at a distance, as Einstein called it, where you know you you do something to one little uh, uh, subatomic particle over here, and it affects it over on the other side of the room in the experiment, or it could be on the other side of the city, it could be on, on the other side of the galaxy, and it will have an instantaneous effect. They're entangled somehow. Okay, anyway, this is weird quantum physics stuff that no one understands, and because Feynman said no one understands it, I take his word for it, because he's a lot smarter than me, and I don't know anything about quantum physics. In any case, so their theory is that, let's say you're thinking certain thoughts, like I'm, I'm looking at the back of a playing card, or one of those Zener cards with the wavy lines, or the circle, or the triangle, or the plus sign, whatever, and I'm thinking about that thought, and you're supposed to read my thoughts, the ESP. So now, as I'm thinking about it, um, my neurons start to fire in a certain pattern, and they get, they get kind of a little sequence of pattern going. And that causes these subatomic particles in the microtubules of my neurons to, to, to collapse in a certain pattern. And, and it leaves my skull, because these things happen across the ether, whatever. And they go into your skull, and that causes your neurons to fire in the same pattern my neurons are firing, and then you read my mind. Okay, that's the theory. I, I don't believe it for a second. I don't think there's anything that even needs to be explained because no one actually can read people's minds under controlled conditions or they can't successfully and repeat, repeatedly read the back of playing cards or anything like that. Nevertheless, let's just, for the thought experiment, say it's true. They can do it and that's the explanation. 
Well, that would no longer be the paranormal. That would not be psi or ESP. That would just be quantum physics or, and neuroscience or quantum consciousness, as Deepak calls it. It would just become a branch of physics and neuroscience. It would just become part of the natural world. So let's dispense with all that language, mind, paranormal, pseudo, whatever. Just forget all that. It's, it's either it's science or it's nothing. It's just part of the natural world or it's nothing. OK. So anyway, I was talking about um, how we're able to project ourselves um, uh, elsewhere, uh, like this sense of, of uh, re mind reading and so on. We do many other things, too, that uh, I find incredibly interesting. That is, we're also able to sense presences in the room with us. Now, this happens under lots of different conditions. In my previous books, I've written about going to Michael Persinger's lab and Laurentian University in Sudbury, Canada, and putting the God helmet on. You can watch this on YouTube. And, and people that do this have an out-of-body experience, and they see aliens or whatever, angels. They experience a sense presence in the room. You're in a, like a sensory deprivation room in one of these big, easy chairs, and it's quiet and dark. And, and he bombards your temporal lobes with these solenoids, with electromagnetic fields. The temporal lobe is just right with, um, with, with being stimulated to produce angelic voices, the sense of God. Any, anything like this. There's lots of examples of this now, epileptic patients that get open brain surgery where they cut the corpus callosum to stop the spread of the seizures from one hemisphere to the other. Amazingly enough, these neuroscientists get their permission to wake them up in the middle of the surgery and poke around and ask them what's going on. And, and this is a remarkable. They agree to do it, <laughs> which I think is great. <laughs> Good for science. And so that's how we're, one, one way to map the brain. You just poke around with electrodes and say, now what's happening? Now what's happening? So for example, there was a, an epileptic uh, patient in 2002 who had this done, temporal lobe, little spot there, where she immediately floated out of her body. She had an out-of-body experience. And then and they, they, they ratcheted the electricity up, and she floated way up. And then they brought it back down, she floated back down, and they touched around, and her arm goes up, her leg goes up, and, and so forth. So they were able to map all this. Of course, she's just lying there. No, nothing's actually happening. This is all in her head. She's talking about it. Right? So we can reproduce these things through this helmet, through electrical stimulation. There's a guy named James Winery who works for the United States Air Force, maybe retired now. Uh, he used to accelerate pilots till they black out, part of their training. And a significant percentage of Winnery's pilots had out-of-body experiences when they were in the process of blacking out. So this is apoxia, oxygen deprivation to the cortex. As the blood gets squeezed to the center of your body and the center of your brain, uh, then your cortex just begins to shut down. The visual cortex on the back just shuts down. may have something to do with th this shutting down in this particular way. Maybe that creates a tunneling effect or maybe a spiraling effect and white light at the end of the tunnel, all those things. In other words, there's lots of different ways we can physically replicate. Um, th these are drug-free and legal, by the way. <laughs> you can do it through sleep deprivation, too, is a really good one. And, and so as I began to research this, uh, I discovered that, in fact, it's not, it's not just th these artificial conditions. In fact, uh, Lindbergh talked about having a sense presence uh, in the cabin of the Spirit of St. Louis as he flew to Paris. This was only 36 hours of sleep deprivation. This is nothing. Every graduate student's done that. <laughs> uh, and he reports in his book, you know, talking to them, and they were talking back to him. And, and uh, Himalayan climbers, and K2 climbers at high altitude, they often talk about um, the sense that somebody is on the rope next to me, talking to me, especially when they're alone. This mainly happens when you're alone. Now, OK, that's high, uh, high altitude, so that might be oxygen deprivation. Uh, and Reinhold Mesner talks about this in his accounts. He, he summited Everest, I think, seven times without oxygen. This, this guy has a lot of experiences to write about. Uh, but it also happens to Arctic explorers and solo sailors. Sailors are at sea level. And when they're alone, they, they hallucinate that there's somebody else right there with them. And they talk to the imaginary friend, and the friend talks back. Uh, this is remarkable. Uh, the Iditarod dog sled mushers, they often talk about sense presences. There's somebody right there on the, on the what you call it, the sled, uh, or on the side of the trail and this sort of thing. Uh, my own friends in uh, Race Across America who, who go um, hours, days without sleep, uh, they, they often report um, seeing people on the side of the road. I had these great hallucinations when I was racing uh, Race Across America. The clusters of mailboxes in the Midwest, they, they become people that are like waving to you. Because sometimes people do come out and wave to you. So you can never be sure if they were mailboxes or people. So you always wave back just in case. 
And of course, I've written many times about my own alien abduction experience after 83 hours without sleep, uh, riding from Santa Monica Pier to Nebraska without stopping. And, and uh, I wanted to see if I could go the whole 3,000 miles, 10 days without any sleep at all, because the record was 11 days. It was in 1983. And I read about this kid at UCLA who went 11 days without sleep. He was playing like uh, pinball games and stuff like that. And I can do it. Anyway, I couldn't do it. And nobody can do it, uh, it turns out, because lots of people have tried in this race since then. And it tur turns out you just can't be that physically tired and go without the sleep. So. But nevertheless, you can have some really great drug-free legal hallucinations, uh, all the product of just, well, we don't really know what. There's a lot of different theories about this, but this is a relatively new area of neuroscience that having to do with uh, stress, perhaps, sleep deprivation, exhaustion, hunger. There's a whole variety of these extreme environments that produce these really strange effects. Okay, the point of all this is that um, to explain why we believe in God, gods, the afterlife, all these things belief in things unseen uh, is part of it. It's not that they're not true. Some things might be true. Some, th that's a separate question that I deal with elsewhere in the book. I'm just fascinated at this point why people believe those things at all. And that just becomes part of neuroscience as an explanation. I also deal with conspiracies as a type of agenticity, I think. The, the idea that there's an intentional agent, somebody or some group of people pulling the strings. We are fascinated by this. You may have noticed the 9-11 truthers are still around. <laughs> the birthers are hanging in there, although, as I said uh, uh, two weeks ago, the, in one week we saw the death of the birthers and the birth of the deathers after uh, bin Laden was killed. And, and, and so why is it that, well, okay, first of all, uh, detecting a, okay, the distinction between a conspiracy and a conspiracy theory. The theory is just the theory about what the conspiracy might be. So that's a, that is what we're assessing when we say, you're just a conspiracy theorist. It, it's become sort of pejorative. It's a way of making fun of somebody. Uh, but in fact, you can have conspiracy theorists, theories because there are really conspiracies. So I acknowledge that at the beginning. Lincoln was assassinated by a conspiracy. You might want to see Robert Redford's new film, The Conspiracist, quite nicely portrays, in fact, how those things actually really go. In other words, the conspiracy theory usually thinks of conspiracies as these well-oiled machines in which everybody's at the right place at the right time and everything just sort of falls into place perfectly. Now, the reason we think that is because of something called the hindsight bias. So the hindsight bias is where, with 2020 hindsight, you just look back and find a plausible, perfect causal chain from where you are now to the beginning, wherever you want to start the sequence. A everybody does this. We, we all think of where we are in our lives now and we look back and go, I know how I got here. This happened and this happened and this happened. And th these things are all true, but of course with hindsight, you, you know the causal pattern already, so it makes perfect sense. When you're back at the beginning of it, it, it makes no sense at all. And, uh, but this is, this is why all autobiography, well, uh, uh, when, I, when I write my autobiography, it's gonna be the unauthorized autobiography. I'm <laughs> not fooling around here. It's a Stephen Wright joke. Anyway, so it, they're all authorized. All, all history is authorized because of the hindsight bias. It's all Whiggish history, all of it. It's, you can't get around the problem. Um, and so uh, when we look at something like uh, the memo of August 9th, 2011, uh, 2001, uh, when Condoleezza Rice gets this piece of intel that says Osama bin Laden will attack on U.S. soil. Wow, incredible. After the fact, that becomes salient and important. How could she have missed that? I mean, that's incredible. We should have seen this coming. Who was not doing their job? Somebody should be fired in some way. That's the hindsight bias, right? But if you actually look back, there's you know 10,000 pieces of intelligence in the, la in the year before 9-11. And uh, which are the right ones to follow? Which are the ones that are actually gonna explain what happened? You don't know until it happens, and then you look back and you pick them. Same thing with Pearl Harbor. You know, memos about the Japanese going to attack Pearl Harbor. Yeah, they're there, along with hundreds of others that they're going to attack here, there, and everywhere. Only when it hap after it happens. Anyway, the point of that is that uh, the conspiracy theories always make perfect sense after it happens, and, and everything happens in a logical sequence. The way conspiracies actually happen are like what happened with the assassination of Franz Ferdinand and his wife in Sarajevo uh, that started World War II, uh, World War One. Right? So this is a great story. I talk about it in length because uh, it's how things usually go. This was a, a real conspiracy. These uh, Serbian nationalists who wanted independence from the Austro-Hungarian Empire uh, plotted to assassinate the um, 
the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, as he was coming to Sarajevo to give a speech. And it was all plotted out. They went to different homes, and they gave their secret password. They asked a question a certain way, and then the weapon was given to them, and so on. Even that didn't completely work out. Not everybody got the right weapon at the right time. Anyway, they, they got enough. And then they were all plotted along the parade route, ready to go. And anyway, one guy chickened out, and another guy got sort of moved by the throng of crowds, and he couldn't do it. And then a third guy threw the hand grenade, and it bounced off the trunk of the Franz Ferdinand's car and rolled underneath the car behind him and blew up and injured those people. Then he sped off. and. And then he went and gave a speech anyway, you know, thanks a lot, people of Sarajevo. I come here in peace and you try to assassinate me. Like, you know, why don't you just go home? <laughs> so then he says, okay, I'm done with my speech. Let's go to the hospital and check out how our comrades are doing who were injured in the explosion. And they go right back down the parade route where there was one last assassin, this guy who had been despondent and he went and got a sandwich at the deli. And he's sitting there on the curb like, oh, this was a failure. And here he comes, like, thank you very much, boom. <laughs> That's how conspiracies usually go. So the idea that 9-11 was an inside job, you know, well oiled by the Bush administration. By the way, you know how we know 9-11 know was not orchestrated by the Bush administration? Because it worked. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> Um, so, uh, so I actually have a like a little conspiracy detection kit in the book about you know these are the ten things you should ask yourself before. The more people that have to be involved, the less likely it is to be true. Um, the the more components that all have to come together at just the right time, the less likely it is to be true. Um, the the grander the conspiracy theory about what was supposed to happen, if you scale it up to like <coughs> world domination, probably not true. Uh, the, those sorts of things you can just ask yourself. And does it is that really the way the world works? No, we know how it works. And people, again, can't keep their mouths shut. So the more people, as G. Gordon Liddy said, uh, you know, three, no, it was Mark Twain. Three people can keep a secret, two of them are dead. Right? It was G. Gordon Liddy who told me when I was on his radio show once, the two problems with conspiracy theories is incompetence and, and uh, leakage. People are, government bureaucrats are incompetent idiots and people can't keep their mouths shut, so forget it. These things are, just, look what happens whenever anybody leaves the State Department after they form their own uh, consulting business in Washington, D.C. and charge huge amounts of money to corporations to give them inside information, which you're not supposed to do. But anyway, that's what they do. And then they go and they write a book and they go on TV and they go on the lecture circuit and they, they tell all of what, all the dirt they saw uh, of what happened in the That's how it really works. Since 9-11, not one person has come forward to say, you know what, I saw these people planning, it was a weird thing, they were in there at midnight and they were sneaking around in the World Trade Center, but I don't know what I saw. Not one story like that has come out. That's how we know it was not an inside job, besides the fact that it worked. Um, and then I talk a little bit about politics. Um, and think about the confirmation bias and the, all the different cognitive biases. Um, in the context of the larger thesis of the book, that beliefs come first, and then the reasons for belief come after the fact. So if you're a Republican, for example, you probably listen to conservative talk radio, and you read the Wall Street Journal, and you filter everything through that. And, uh, and if you're liberal, you listen to progressive talk radio. Well, I guess nobody listens to progressive talk radio. You listen to NPR, and then you read the New York Times or whatever, and you filter everything through that. Now, of course, nobody says I'm a Republican because my parents were, my peer group, they're all Republicans, so, you know, I just go along with the herd. Nobody thinks that. Nobody says that. What we say is, well, I have all these reasons. I have my 12 reasons why I vote Republican or Democrat, why I believe in free markets or fair markets, you know, why I have this attitude or that attitude about gays or abortion or whatever. Uh, but, but my claim is that the beliefs all come first through a whole series of social, politi uh, political, psychological, personal, where you happen to be born, who your parents were, where, where you were raised, what schools you went to. <clears throat> Those things all shape our beliefs. Even for scientists, <clears throat> that is that nobody comes to the table uh, and just scatters the data out there and goes, I think I'll see which is the best hypothesis to explain it. No, because uh, to even become a scientist, you have to go to graduate school. And go to graduate school, you have to be accepted into some program in which a professor will allow you to work in his lab. This professor is not unbiased. He has his own pet theories and hypotheses, his worldview, his paradigm that he's working in, along with the community of his colleagues. So you're already sort of pushed along in that. By the time you become a scientist, you're way down the path. You already believe all sorts of things. Before you know, you know hardly any of what the data is. You're just sort of sucked into it. And then, 
And then you look for the data to fit it. Okay, so we have the same problem in science that everybody else has. The difference is, is that if you don't look for your disconfirming data against your theory, somebody else will advance their career by debunking your silly theory in a published forum with great glee, and that's what makes science different. It's a competitive enterprise. And so I, then I kind of wrap up the book talking about how science works and, and, and then politically how democracy works. I think in many ways a democracy is like an experiment. <clears throat> and in fact, it's not an accident that the founders called the American process an, an experiment. It's the American experiment in democracy. What did, what did they mean by this? Well, first of all, these guys all had training in the natural sciences. Jefferson, Thomas Paine, Franklin, these guys were all what we would call scientists. They didn't even use that word back then, but uh, natural philosophy. They understood the importance of understanding the laws of nature and that there must be social laws of nature. Uh, this is sort of the basis of natural rights theory. Our rights come from nature, this sort of thing, right? So they're looking for this. And, and in a way, an election is like an experiment. <clears throat> Let's throw the bums out and try something new. We'll bring them some new bums, and we'll try a new tax system. We'll try a different you know, law, series of laws, whatever. And we'll see how it goes. We'll collect the data and run it and see what happens. And in fact, this is what political scientists often do is look at the tax rates in one state or county versus the tax rates in another state or county, and then look what the outcome differences are. That's kind of an experiment, right? So the, the hope we have for getting beyond the, the trap of being stuck in our beliefs is science. Not that scientists are any better than anybody else or special or even well-trained, even though they are trained to be skeptics. That, in fact, that the process itself is the one savior that we have just like a democracy. It's the, and, and the point is that we don't know how to govern. This is our founding fathers. We don't know how to govern. Nobody does. So we have to set up a system that allows for constant change and feedback and, and retweaking the system and sciences like that. We don't know what the truth is. Nobody does. We just have provisional truth, the small t, and that we're going to just do the best we can and keep running the experiments, right? So then I kind of wrap it up uh, and just say that, you know, science, begins with the very opposite of the way the brain works, back to where you know, the hominid on the plains of Africa. The default rule is just believe everything is true. <clears throat> in science, the default rule is the null hypothesis. None of it's true. All your ideas are crazy ideas and probably wrong. Now, the burden of proof is on you to prove me wrong. Reject the null hypothesis. Show us your data. So I, I use these simple examples because most the average person understands this on a some level because they've heard things like that a drug got approval because it passed clinical trials. Well, what does that mean? It means that we assume that your drug doesn't do anything. <clears throat> and By the way, in homeopathy it works great. <clears throat> <laughs> it does nothing. But we assume the null hypothesis, your drug doesn't do anything. Now you've got to go run those experiments, do those epidemiological studies, have the control group, the experimental group. You, the subjects are blinded. We have to blind the subject because of the confirmation bias, placebo effect, expectation bias, and so on. They may change their behavior. Ooh, I'm getting the cancer drug. Cool, I think I'll change my diet. I'll sleep more. I'll exercise extra special. I'll really, okay, that, so now we don't know if it's the drug or these other things, right? So we have to blind them. And the experimenter, if he knows which, condition the subject is in. He's likely to record the data incorrectly. This has been proven. So it has to be double blind and so on. All these things are there for a reason because of our believing brain. The, the fact that we have all those cognitive biases, they're all built in there. You can't get around them other than to have some system of checks and balances. And so that's the best hope we have for the world, democracy, for us individually, science. Thank you. <laughs> oh, I forgot to read the last paragraph. Anyway, that's okay. We'll just do Q&A now, if anybody would like to come to the... There's, there's two microphones. Uh, nice talk. Thanks very much. Uh, you talk a lot about why we believe. How do we change a deeply held belief? Once you believe something very strongly, how do you discard that belief and move to another one? How do you change someone's brain? Right. <clears throat> Um, well, it has to come about by uh, changing, uh, initially changing the, the like social circle surrounding the person. Like so, in the book, I have a chapter about my own belief transition from being an evangelical uh, Christian at Pepperdine University, where I was surrounded by other Christians. And even though I began to read other philosophers and scientists and so on, uh, the doubts are all kept in check by your surrounding social circle. And in that worldview, it's 
logically consistent. It's internally coherent. It all, it all makes sense. And then when you leave that world, that circle, it all changes. So this is one of the big problems we face. Like we get uh, a lot of letters, I get a lot of letters from people who live like in the Midwest and, and they live in a little town and everybody they know goes to church and they believe in God and, and, they, and they just discovered that they don't believe. You know, they get this, you know, I found Skeptic Magazine at the bookstore, I couldn't believe it. And can you mail it to me in like a brown wrapper so nobody <laughs> sees it? <laughs> and I feel sorry for him because you know, if I say, well, you have to give up all those beliefs and, and, and believe the science stuff. You know, if you give, a, give somebody a choice between that and giving up their friends, family, social circle, everything, that's a tough choice to make, right? So part of the sell is to say, look, you don't have to give up anything. Just keep, just keep whatever you want. Go for the science. And then what will happen is slowly but surely they'll start to drop the superstitions as they see that the, sci the way science works, it doesn't allow this, it doesn't allow that. And you have to allow people to do it quietly on their own. It's very rare that anybody just stands up and goes, you know what, I was wrong. That almost never happens. Uh, rarely would a, does, do politicians ever say, you know what, that, that whole conservative thing, forget it, I'm, I'm switching parties, right? I mean, who's the last person who did that? Lieberman, I guess, right? I mean, it's so big, it makes headline news. That almost never happens. Um, so you have to sort of make it possible for people to do that without losing anything. Um, and, uh, and then there's a whole series I, I recommend, for example, um, uh, Robert Childowney's book, Influence. So he has like the seven most important things you can do to influence somebody's beliefs. Now he's mostly, it's dealing with like marketing products, stuff like that. He's a social psychologist who specializes in like marketing and advertising. Uh, but really the, the experimental psychologists are just way behind uh, all the marketing guys, they already know what these principles are, how to shift people from this to that. So there's, there's some really, really simple tried and true things, you know, uh, of reciprocity and giving somebody something and they feel they have to give it to you back. There's ways to do this with ideas. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Shermer. First of all, you're awesome. Um, second <laughs> of all, uh, Deepak Chopra and, by the way, Gene Houston, they don't realize it, but you and Sam Harris embarrass them. At, the nightline debate. Thank you. <laughs> um, so here's my question. Um, I believe this relates to brain activity very much. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts on it. Um, there have been reports, uh, people have written books about you know, people having experiences seeing both sides of the afterlife. There's a book called 23 Minutes in Hell um, by a guy who, as the title says, thinks he saw hell uh, in graphic detail. Uh, there's people, reports of uh, people seeing what they think is heaven, the book 90 Minutes in Heaven, the book that you referenced on one of your Facebook posts, Heaven is for Real. Uh, so what generates these beliefs? Uh, what, you know, what are your thoughts on them as a scientist? Right. Well, most of my talk uh, did deal with uh, what generates the beliefs. That is, the brain is capable of, of producing these sorts of incredible, elaborate uh, illusions and hallucinations of a person, person or as people that describe being in his little sensory deprivation room with the helmet on uh, of going to hell and describing what it was like. Of course, the problem is how do we, how do we confirm this without actually having to go? Because, <laughs> you know, I was thinking maybe I didn't want to go. Uh, but on the other hand, most of my good friends will be there. Um, so I, <laughs> and, and, and so since there's no way to test it, then we have to come around it from the side and just say, well, okay, what could produce those sorts of things? And of course, not everybody tells the same story about what they see in heaven or hell except for the problem of cultural contamination. Like decades ago, aliens looked like all sorts of different colors and shapes and sizes, and now they all look pretty much the same. It's kind of reduced to the greens and the grays, uh, who are apparently living in New Mexico, fighting it out underground or something. Um, but before that, you know, the Swedish aliens were like tall and blonde hair, and you know, they all looked obviously geographically determined. What happened was is that pop culture established what the aliens looked like when NBC did that film in 1980 about the Betty and Barney Hill abduction story. And the, and the artist constructed the aliens for the TV show. And ever since then, that's what gets portrayed in pop culture so people have that burned into their memories. So when they have the hallucination, that's what the aliens look like. If you lived 500 years ago, you wouldn't be seeing aliens at all. You'd be seeing demons, incubi and succubi. So that, that's the process of producing it. Uh, it can't be tested, obviously, short of going there, finding aliens or something like that. So then we're left with the, the neuroscience explaining it. 
and it's pretty obvious now with the research we have that <clears throat> lots and lots of people, a significant percentage, probably maybe even two digits percentage figure have some kind of anomalous psychological experience in their life, a deja vu. I mean, people report that, like maybe even two thirds. But, but, but actually scientifically, you know, really getting down to it, maybe a third of all people have had some weird anomalous experience like that. So it's common. Uh, hi, my name is Tim. Thanks for coming tonight. Um, a couple questions. Have you studied cargo cults much? Are you, you know, if you have, can you just talk about them a little bit? You know, I haven't read that much about them because I find that you know, I haven't found a lot of good studies to read about it. But, you know, do you find that there are a lot of similarities to them, uh, between them, and then uh, between cargo cults and Christianity? Why do you think they had, um, why do you think they took the shape that they did? And right. how those beliefs sort of formed. Um, and you know. yes, yeah, so the question is on cargo cults, um, which are these, uh, which is this phenomenon after the Second World War, in which some of these uh, South Pacific Islanders had constructed faux runways and faux airport towers to get the planes to return with the cargo, which they saw, which because it was real, it really happened. Um, and so, but they, of course, had a misunderstanding of causality. <laughs> but, the, but the interesting part is how this then gets repeated and replicated. And it's a nice example of, the, of watching in real time the construction of a myth or a religion, something like that. Um, so I do talk about that. I think uh, other interesting examples of s things similar to that would be resurrection myths are pretty common, virgin birth myths are pretty common, flood myths are pretty common. Uh, and you can diffuse the claim by Christians to uniqueness by pointing out that there are plenty of these central core stories about the resurrection, the virgin birth, and so on that predate the, the Christian story, even the, the Noachian flood story, the Old Testament story. Um, the uh, Epic of Gilgamesh is a flood story that predates by many centuries. That's so you can just kind of uh, come at it from an anthropological perspective, which is really what kind of did me in, one of the things that did me in as a believer was actually just studying other people's beliefs from an anthropological or social psychological perspective. It really makes you realize these guys all believe just like me. <laughs> and they all think they're right too. What are the chances that I got it right? Well, most people, if you push them, they'll go, well, yeah, actually I do think I'm the right one. Uh, but you know, just a smithering, smithering of humility, you, you have to realize that these things are socially constructed. So although I can't prove there's no God, technically, I think we can make a really good case, I do in my God chapter, a really good case that religions and belief in God are completely constructed by us, by our brains, by our cultures. I think that's a reasonable argument to make against the theistic claims. Uh, first of all, Dr. Shermer, just great lecture in general. Um, so I'm only 18, so forgive the naivety of my question. I'm just going to pose a standard philosophical inquiry to you and see what your response is. I mean, you mentioned earlier in the uh, lecture that the mind basically, for all intents and purposes, doesn't exist. Like, you seem to embrace some kind of identity theory that mental states are just identical or reducible to correlate neural states. So what do you think, what are your views on, like, phenomenal feelings? Like, aside from the behavioral dispositions that pain may induce or the behavior mm -hmm. that precedes pain, mm -hmm. what do you think of the actual mental phenomenal quality of pain or happiness, for that matter? Do you think that these phenomenal states prove the existence of some mental reality that's not just empirical? That's a pretty damn good question for an 18-year-old. I'm impressed. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, OK, so this is a huge problem in philosophy of mind. Take entire college courses that spend 30 weeks on this or whatever. Not, so I can't answer it simply. but. In my, I'm a monist, so most people are dualists. We're natural born dualists, as they say. We just naturally think there's two things. There's body and mind. There's corporeal and incorporeal. There's you know, body and soul, whatever. That's why we can watch movies like Freaky Friday and get the humor of Lindsay Lohan and Jamie Lee Curtis switching bodies. But what could possibly be switching? Because your brain mostly just runs your body. It's all integrated. You have entire maps of your body in your brain. How could you possibly switch them? I mean, if you think about it, uh, 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 being a brain donor <coughs> or a recipient, this is the one uh, organ donation where you want to be the donor, <laughs> not the recipient, because that's where you're located. And so I come back to the, 
the claim, uh, the very simple ob observation that when neurons die, all of that phenomenon is gone. Pain, pleasure, greenness, everything is gone. It's gone. And until somebody can show me where it is without the brain, like it's actually stored in the matrix somewhere. Uh, Deepak used the analogy of hardware software. You know, you have your computer hardware, you put soft, okay. But you know, when you buy the Microsoft Office, you get a box with disks, and, and these disks are, the, the software is stored in there physically. You still need some substrate, a media, some physical medium to hold the, the, the software, the, the program, as it were. The DNA still requires the molecules. It doesn't exist without it, and so I claim that all the things you just described still require neurons firing, and without that, there's nothing. So to me, the, all the phenomenon and all the words you used, which are correct, that those are what philosophers of science uh, of mind use, those are still just fuzzy words to describe something we just really don't understand. So, I mean, I'm, this comes back to my behavioral roots. I was a behavioral psych psychologi psychologist. Quit using all that language. This is with Skinner's point. Quit using those words. They, they don't help us at all. It's like saying, well, God did it, or a miracle happened, like my favorite Sidney Harris cartoon, you know, with the two mathematicians at the chalkboard, and he writes in the middle of the long equations, and then a miracle happens. And he says, I think you need to be more explicit here in step two. Uh, that's the problem with all those words. They're just fuzzy words that say, and then something weird happens. I, feel, I felt pain, or I experienced love. It, that is completely unhelpful. It doesn't tell us anything. We have to get down to the neuro, okay, oxytocin. Wow, boy, do I feel strong attachment to this other person when I get a hit of oxytocin. Now we're getting somewhere. We're getting there. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Right, so that 18-year-old uh, student, he asked my original questions. So okay. <laughs> He's way ahead of you. <laughs> so I just was going to ask you if you knew that Persinger has recently been claiming to observe telepathy. Yeah, I, I heard that. And uh, I haven't talked to him in, in years, so but I heard that from somebody else. I thought, oh, hmm, OK. Yeah, I just think it's interesting. Yeah, I think he's out there on some of that. So I don't, I don't completely buy his, his theory is you know, bombarding the temporal lobes with electromagnetic fields, because where does that happen in the real world? And in, in any case, those things are right pressed up against your skull. So they're pretty close. Uh, there's nothing like that. I mean, cell phone towers um, and, uh, you know, earth, well, he thinks like earthquake faults may generate these things, which would explain Southern California, where I'm from, <laughs> and why people have these weird, but they're contaminated by performance enhancing drugs for mines. Anyway, sorry, yeah. yeah so that's that was it, okay. <coughs> so I've read both of your other books um, on belief, also how we believe and why we believe in weird things. Can you talk to a bit um, the difference between those books and this book and what motivated you to, to kind of add one to the series about belief? Uh, sure. Um, as I said, you know, the first book was about weird things, it's about all things. So, and how we believe was really slightly misnamed. It should have been why people believe in God, because that's what that's about. Although back then we didn't have, uh, I mean, back then, 10 years ago. I mean, neuroscience is flying, you know, there's so much research uh, that you have to keep writing to stay up with it. So this is more of the modern stuff. But again, I'm going for the much bigger picture here um, of moving away from the stuff that Skeptic Magazine deals with, the weird things, to everything, politics, economics, cultural attitudes, your, your beliefs about gays and abortion, and all these things are, they're all the same process of finding patterns. I've only just touched on stuff in the book. I mean, we are tribal. So I have a whole thing about our <coughs> evolutionary propensity to be, uh, to be tribal, to be loyal to your fellow in-group members. This includes embracing their ideas that this is why conservatives tend to favor certain moral values that, that emphasize uh, patriotism and family and group cohesiveness and a band of brothers kind of thing, which then leads to if you don't con consistently believe our central tenets, you're a, a wishy-washy, mamby-pamby, bedwetting flip-flopper. You know, it has moral assessment to it. You're not just wrong, you're an idiot. You're evil wrong, right? So that's all wrapped up in our beliefs. That goes way beyond all the, the other stuff I used to talk about. Yep. Hi, I'm Anthony, and thank you for your lecture. Uh, you have been talking about, you know, the process that happening in the brain, neuroscience, and dopamine, and everything like that. And 
you know, I'm wondering that how can you really relate uh, the system of belief developed by people in their social environment? <coughs> and I have a second question. Uh, it's about the, the and you know the system of belief developed by people, for example, about the religion. It's about the, the fact that you know religion can be um, an easy answer to question. And how can you? I mean, how can we really? Uh, oh, oh, oh. How can we really like uh, give an answer to people? But a full answer, like an easy answer to their question, which means, like the the problem that the science cannot answer everything because we are constantly in yeah. the process of a search. So, can I, how can we really face to that, and how can we push people to become critical thinker and to search for evidence instead of simple answer? Okay, I got it. Right. So, well, first of all, you can. You can encourage people to subscribe to Skeptic Magazine. <laughs> Operators are standing by. Uh, well, I mean, what we're doing as a movement, uh, as I started off the evening, the grassroots, bottom-up movement, we're all just kind of working on this together. You do it just through conversations. Just, again, start with that null hypothesis. Just say, that's nice. Prove it. Well, that's an interesting idea. Where's your proof for that? What's the evidence? You know, engage in conversation in a friendly, respectful way. And, pull them in toward the critical thinking side. So uh, we and lots of other groups have lots of little things you could do. We, we have like the baloney detection kit, you know. These are like the 10 questions you should ask anybody that makes a claim, right? That kind of, like the baloney de detection, the conspiracy detection. These are the questions you should ask. So that's, that's one way to do it, just, um, just by word of mouth, just the same way the Tea Partiers do. Just think of political analogies for how, how everybody in politics is after the undecided voter. We want to shift them from here to there. How do we get them? Okay, you, you do this, you do that. Tried and true, these guys have been at it for you know, a century or more, professionals. So I, I'm just saying we should do that for science. And we are, lots of people are. <coughs> so that's the way to do it. Science can't answer everything. Well, yeah, I guess, but, um, but it's been left out of so many conversations, like morality. Why can't scientists have a say in the, what's right and wrong? Why can't we study that? That should be okay, what's wrong with that? Uh, maybe we won't be able to get the answers, but heck, the philosophers and theologians have been at it for you know 4,000 years, and you know they're okay. I think we can do better, so let's give it a shot. Maybe we're wrong, whatever, but let's try it. So, you know that understand love things like that. Let's do it. Okay. Nope. Yeah, we gotta keep moving. Sorry. Um, I'm actually friends with the guy, the 18 year old, I'm 17, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, I, come up with a better one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not gonna ask like a smarter question because like we actually kind of, him and me, we represent kind of two different sides. We, we get in a lot of arguments all the time and I'm kind of the less skeptical of the two, you could say, although I'm still an agnostic and I still kind of reject a lot of religions, but recently I've um, been reading a lot of Carl Jung and I'm probably gonna get, get, get a lot of like browns, but um, like I've been reading him and we get in a lot of arguments, my friend and I, about kind of the, um, if it's true or not, and, I'm, and he says, well, prove it, and I said, and I say really, well, I can't prove it because it's an individual uh, belief. And even though I know that, that make, make it not true in the real world, like, if it's true to me, then that's, especially for this case of psychology and spiritual psychology, then that's really all that matters to me. And I, and I don't really, and I guess I really don't care if I'm being irrational. So I'm wondering, yeah. Uh, excuse me. Okay, thank you. I'm wondering how you feel. How you how you feel about that? Yeah, it's all right. Everybody, calm down. <laughs> He's doing fine. You did great. That was a great question. Uh, it's an important question. I mean, that's that's everything. What's the difference between what I believe and what you believe? And is there some way we can get at it? That is the question, right? So, like, I make a distinction between when I say, when somebody says, "Well, do you believe in global warming or do you believe in evolution?" That's a little bit different, isn't it, than saying, do you believe in, in democracy, or do you believe in equal rights, or do you believe in uh, free will, or something like that, right? Uh, I mean, at least with like global warming, we should be able to answer it, at least in principle, empirically. Just collect enough data, we should be able to get an answer. And on that one, I think we do have an answer. Uh, evolution, believe it. It, it, it just happened. It's like, do you believe in gravity? Well, I hope so. <laughs> uh, so th but those are different than, than say political beliefs. But even there, I think we can make a case. Like, I would say that, that a liberal democracy, or a democracy of any kind, 
is really measurably quantitatively better than a dictatorship. And you have only to look at pictures at night of North Korea and South Korea and where the border is. It's light, it's dark. Just look at the heights of North Koreans and South Koreans. South Koreans are like five inches taller than North Koreans. Look at the average GDP per capita. GDP is like 1,700 for North Koreans, about 20,000 for South Koreans. Some systems really do work absolutely quantitatively better than others, and I think we can prove that scientifically. And that's also shifting belief in a sort of fuzzy way to a more quantitative way. Uh, now, then, then it really gets fuzzy, like, well, do you believe in love or something like that? You know, well, okay. I believe in oxytocin. Well, that, that doesn't sound very romantic. <laughs> so uh, there, I, I admit, it, we get into more fuzzy ground. But again, why not let science have a crack at it and see how we do and see what happens? So thank you for, thank the, you. Thank you for the good question. Yes, uh, there's a lot, a lot of intelligent people. I asked a relatively educated, <coughs> semi-intelligent doctor, Orthodox Jew, when the grand rabbi was getting ready to die and he was brain dead. I said, what are you going to say when he goes from brain dead to really in the ground running dead? And he said, I'm not going to answer. It's a stupid question because it can't happen. I didn't thumb my nose at him when it did happen. Uh, when you say to an agnostic and atheist, as I am, and you say, well, F, you know, God, you say, uh, even they, get upset and, you know, at some level are afraid, and I won't say that I'm not. And lastly, when, when the hanging oil drop experiment, if you look at his notebooks of the original data, and he goes, too high, too low, beauty, that's the exact quote. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this is his religion, too, and he's he made the ultimate experiment. So what you're after there is, what are, uh, what are you Everybody after Everybody is fooling themselves to some oh, extent. Oh, I see. Right. I thought you were going to ask me what I would say to God if... And I have it in here. <laughs> I do. Do you, do you say F God? Uh, what, what I would, no, I wouldn't use the F word because, you know, <laughs> if there's a God, then I've got to start being nice. <laughs> uh, by the way, on the agnostic, the 17-year-old the is uh, agnostic. Uh, I have a long discussion of that, too, because it's one of these words that bothers atheists, you know, agnostic. You know? And then I remember when I was on Colbert the last time, he said, told me that an agnostic is just an atheist without balls. And I thought, oh, yeah, I don't want to be one of those guys. So yeah, OK. Uh, these are, again, these are just labels that we use to shortcut uh, thinking about what people believe. I don't like them because I'd rather just describe what I believe. Do you believe in God? No. OK, then, end of story. That's different than, of course, technically saying, I can't prove there's a God. Does that make me a strong atheist or a weak atheist or a militant agnostic? I don't know, and you don't either, like the bumper sticker said. <laughs> You know, there's a whole series of those jokes. Okay, well, what, here's what I would say if it turns out there's a God. Uh, so it's not funny, it's what I would actually say, I think. Uh, Lord, I did the best I could with the tools you granted me. You gave me a brain to think skeptically and I used it accordingly. You gave me the capacity to reason and I applied it to all claims, including that of your existence. You gave me a moral sense and I felt the pangs of guilt and the joys of pride for the bad and good things I chose to do. I tried to do unto others as I would have them do unto me, and although I felt far short, fell far short of this ideal far too many times, I tried to apply your foundational principle whenever I could. Whatever the nature of your immortal and infinite spiritual essence actually is, as a mortal, finite, corporeal being, I cannot possibly fathom it despite my best efforts. And so, do with me what you will. <laughs> That's what I'm going to say. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> Although I'm pretty confident I'll never have to say it, so I haven't like written it on my palm like Sarah does. <coughs> pretty, pretty, pretty confident. Yeah, I'm, I'm pr pretty, I'm right, right, really super confident. <coughs> I'd be shocked, in fact, <laughs> if it turned out there was a God. I would be. I'd say, is, is this a Penn and Teller thing? I mean, come on. Cop I've seen Copperfield do better than this, you know, right? Like if there was a resurrection, you know, they'd re Come on. I've seen this on stage. <laughs> you want to do uh, two, more, uh, two or three more questions? Okay, who's... Uh, go ahead. Hi, Michael. Um, you have written previously about, uh, and I apologize if I'm not describing it correctly, but the Max Planck theory or hypothesis where you say 
beliefs and accepted truths and things of the time die out as the generations die out and get right. in place. I was wondering if you could expand on that in, um, in relationship to religion and why religion's been around for so long, yet it seems like in the latest Gallup polls and whatnot, it seems like we're in the midst of a takeover almost. Um, I personally don't believe that, but uh, could you kind of link the yeah. two? Or so as a reference to Planck is uh, Planck's description of how science changes one funeral at a time, or when the old guys die and the new grad students become professors, that's how science changes. Well, that's, that's a little grossly oversimplified, but approximately speaking, the older you get, the more difficult it is to change your mind, simply because behaviorally you're more committed to the idea, whether it's a scientific theory or a political belief or whatever. So that, that is true. There is data to show that, although people do change their minds. In science, the thing is that if the whole community starts to shift and you don't go along with it, and the reason they're shifting is because there's new data. And you're, you know, steadfastly holding on to the old idea. You don't care what the old data says. What happens is, is you just sort of get left out. You're not invited to speak at conferences anymore. Your papers aren't published in journals. It isn't a conspiracy against you in some nefarious top-down way. It's just that you're not, you're not playing the game of science anymore the way it's played. You have, you have to change your mind if there's new data and everybody else recognizes it. And that's what happens. And that's a good thing, so on that. Um, you asked me something else that was uh, related to religion. Oh, religion, yeah. So, religion. Okay. So, what happens when, <clears throat> like, a, a cult becomes a sect or a religion? Uh, the critical turning point is when the the leader dies. <clears throat> so, if there's a secession plan uh, f th that succeeds, then usually you can make the transition. And what they do is they go more mainstream. Uh, they become less weird, and the and the weirdos leave or whatever because they're not happy or they're outed, ousted. Uh, and then they and then they become a religion. If that doesn't happen, then the cult just dies and with the with the death of the leader. So Mormonism is a perfect example of this. You know, when um, Joseph Smith died, there was that critical point where Brigham Young took over, and and he was a dynamic leader, and he made that transition um, from you know kind of cultish, sectish, weird. They're still a little weird, admittedly, but but most Mormons you meet, you know, they're super nice people, and you know they don't do weird stuff and. Um, and so they made that transition uh, geographically by moving to Utah, you know, where there was you know no one around. But you can always see the, you know the the mainstreaming where they got a new revelation from God about polygamy, just before the federal government said, "We're coming in to clean the house if you don't straighten things out yourself." Oh well, God just told us that you know the polygamy thing was out. <laughs> Same thing happened uh, about their treatment of of blacks and you know after the civil rights movement, it's like you, you better get your act straight here or else. And then God spoke again and said, you know what, <laughs> African Americans are actually okay. Oh, okay. Right, so religions uh, follow the trends of culture, not vice versa. Don't be, don't be fooled by Dinesh D'Souza and these guys that I debate about how if it wasn't for Christianity, the abolitionist movement wouldn't have, wouldn't have succeeded. The abolitionist succeeded, movement succeeded despite the church, right? Yes, Wilberforce was a Christian, but he was a liberal Christian who fought mightily against his fellow conservative Christians. He had to overcome that, not the secularists or anything like that. So religion typically follows the trends of culture. Um, and so that, why do they hang in there? Well, because I think our brains are wired up for, you know, to see these hidden agents and so on. Those are gods. I, I, it would be hard to imagine that that would ever completely go away. But one way to diffuse the power of religion is to, for somebody else to take over what they do. So like in the northern European countries, Norway and Sweden, the governments do what religions do here, feed the poor, man, man the soup kitchens, take care of people that need help. Uh, and so that this is one explanation for why religions are kind of dead in northern Europe, is that, is that the government does what religions do. So I mean, because religion you know, has, it serves a social purpose. And, and if you take the purpose away, then there's nothing for it to do. And, and give them tax money, by the way. Give them tax dollars from the government if you really want to kill them. Seriously. <laughs> Separation of church and state. If I, if I wanted to promote religion, I'd separate church and state. Don't give them a dollar of the government money. No tax money. Then, then, what, they would do, then when, what they do is they go out and hustle for it, and then they become really good at marketing, and, and they become relevant to people. That you have to, to keep people coming every week, you have to give them something they want. It's like a, it's like a co comp competition. It's like a marketplace. And then they become more relevant, or they die out. In Europe, they just get tax dollars, and they don't care, so they have no motivation. 
So I'm just giving you a formula of how to create your own religion, sustain it, make a lot of money. <laughs> but you should donate to the Skeptic Society instead of your religion. Yes. Uh, Stuart Avron, uh, like you, I suppose, for lack of a better term, a neurobiological monist. <clears throat> but a uh, question uh, from evolutionary uh, neurobiology. Uh, well, just very quickly, as you know, uh, the neocortex sits on top of more primitive brain structures, and we evolved with the creatures that you refer to uh, who think without uh, neocortical linguistic capabilities. So the question I have is if you could speak to uh, the dilemma we face as being partly, if not wholly, a result of uh, emotive-based thinking, which is evolutionarily quite old, and uh, the inability of belief associated with an emotional commitment uh, to be ameliorated through linguistic intervention. Mm -hmm. Right, well that is uh, re really what the book is about, is that we form these beliefs for a whole bunch of reasons that are mostly emotionally driven. And the research, the really good research on this, um, it came from behavioral economists and, and behavioral f uh, financial guys that wanted to know what people actually do do when they make decisions. So the larger field is decision-making theory, decision uh, research. Uh, and in fact, we hardly ever make rational decisions based on the evidence, you know? We, um, Kahneman and Tversky discovered this uh, in their classic paper in Science. They described the buzzing, blurry world that we live in with just data just flowing all over the place. You can't possibly process all that data. It's impossible. So basically, everything we decide is based on just a few little data points. We take hunches, we make guesses, we're in, we use intuition, and we employ all these little uh, rules of thumb, these heuristics, these little biases that we have that you know usually work pretty well. They get us there. Um, good enough uh, to solve the basic problems of life. And, and we know from people that have damage to their limbic system, uh, the amygdala and so forth, they, they have a hard time making any decisions at all. They sit there in front of the toothpaste section at the <laughs> supermarket going, oh my God, this one's green, this one's blue, this, oh, this one costs this, that one has this. I can't decide, you know, they just, because uh, you don't make decisions on, based on toothpaste. You go, well, I like the taste of this one, or it's got a pretty blue package. <laughs> you would never say that, of course, no one ever says that, but that's what we do. I would. <laughs> you would, okay. So we'll just take uh, one more question here, sorry, but uh, we, uh, I will hang out and talk afterwards, uh, and we're, I guess there's a reception afterwards, and I'll talk to you guys too. I'd like to go back to that Australia between Cave and uh, your book, The Believing Brain. Uh, where does the non-believing brain come from? How right. do you see this? Uh, is, it, uh, is it at an a priori level that you have a better brain, that you have a brain that's has a better prefrontal cortex and a stronger inhibition of subcortical Olympic structures. I like to get your sense of where this comes from. Yes, well, we don't really know that much about it, uh, to be frank. Uh, an interesting line of research that's being pursued by Sam Harris and others uh, is scanning the brains of skeptics versus believers. So I, I do have a description of a couple of experiments, uh, FM. FMRI brain scan experiments that have been done with believers and skeptics. So we have a little sense of this, but it's still, uh, we don't really know much about it. My, my general claim is that brains in general are not good at being skeptical. Again, the default rule of thumb is just believe is real if you hear it. Science is counterintuitive, the whole null hypothesis. We begin with not believing your, your claim. But of course, as I sh showed with the, the paper pencil test about who believes what on ESP and so on, there's great variation. Some are naturally, by temperament, more skeptical and more, those are more believers. And we're kind of getting a sense of what that might entail culturally, neurologically, or whatever. But this is one of these great new areas uh, to understand the future of skepticism. So we can infuse more dopamine or less dopamine and get more skeptic members or something like that. <laughs> More oxytocin so everybody uh, has a good time at our conferences or whatever. <laughs> Actually, they do that with adult beverages at night. But anyway, <laughs> so. thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.